Our society places a high value on love as it is seen as the most important part of personal identity. Expectations set by friends and family to find a partner, for example, or engage with your desires and passions often make love an unavoidable sought after goal. Reaching the state of being, however, often ignores its downsides and effects on personal health, such as distresses that arise from a breakup or the inability to move on to healthier relationships. Author Angela Chen suggests that because we hold love in such a high regard, looking to correct this feeling when it causes suffering is seen as taboo. To her, there is no reason to suggest that the feeling of love is different from an addiction or even a mental illness, so it should be treated as one. Because love can result in one's suffering, it's important to ask whether love addiction can be seen as a mental illness, even if this suffering is deemed acceptable by society. One way of determining whether love addiction is a mental illness involves the method set by Edwards. In this normative conception, a mental illness is a dysfunction of personhood, which, when possessed, licenses a person to take the sick role. The meanings of sick role and license are highly debated, but this definition is crucial overall because of its emphasis on the impairment of rationality and agency, which allows a sufferer to not be morally responsible for having the condition. Edwards' theory also sets the groundwork for a list of five criteria that one should consider when determining whether a condition is a mental illness. Because love is a concept that contains significant societal value today and is thought of as the ideal norm, we will determine whether love addiction has a big enough effect to be classified as a mental disorder based on its response to the criteria. Ultimately, I conclude that love addiction should not be categorized as an inherent mental disorder as it does not satisfy enough of the following criteria to be considered one. It's important to remember, however, that this should not be the end-all be-all for conclusively establishing love addiction as a mental illness as noted by Edwards. But it gets the ball rolling for us talking about love addiction as a mental illness based on a normative ideology. For the first question, many would argue that love addiction can be harmful to the person who has it as it causes feelings of delusion while being in the state of mind uh, as noted by Chen for however wonderful it can feel to be in love this most central of human emotions can also be an insane and delusive passion and a dangerous one as well when love becomes dangerous we need path to safety even if this will require the swallowing of a pill it seems clear then that this feeling can cause an unnecessary amount of damage to one's sense of self which is a necessary but not sufficient condition for it being labeled as mental illness. Now for the second question, if love addiction were to be a mental illness, one would need to assert that it can't be a legitimate part of one's personality. Chen's suggestion that our propensity to avoid obsessive love with no reciprocal value points to the idea that it can't be a legitimate part of one's personality since we would not consciously embody these largely negative features as a part of our essence as a person. Because the sensation of love would not be a sought after or part of our personality, this gives evidence in favor of love addiction being a mental illness. The third criterion asks if the mental condition in question is one that can be discouraged through the inculcation of appropriate moral values during childhood. For love, though, it seems that the opposite is the case, according to Chen. It has come to pass, writes the cultural theorist Laura Kipnis, that saying no to love isn't just heresy, it's tragedy. Uh, for our sort, the failure to achieve what is essentially most human. To opt out of this experience is to be monstrous a loser and someone who must be fixed. Love addiction currently doesn't seem to be discouraged through the instantiation of moral values in a youth's life because most of the values nowadays seem to promote being in love. Because pursuing love is never truly discouraged in society and instead encouraged, this would allow the love addiction condition to be thought of more as a mental illness. It just doesn't seem plausible that there are moral values warning of the danger of falling in love, though this idea is challenged by the next example. Regarding the fourth question, will applying moral responsibility to the condition help uphold broader moral values in one's ethical system? If we can apply moral responsibility to the feelings of infatuation to help uphold broader values about moderating love, this application would render the condition of excessive love controllable, which would not allow the person to take the sick role. Though persisting for love is seen as beneficial nowadays, it is possible to construct 
rules that limit the influence of love which had occurred in previous societies. Stories of star-crossed lovers whose painful affairs could never survive the norms of their time go back centuries. Romantic love was subordinate to social status and economic security, and marriage remained a pragmatic arrangement. In a different era, these infatuations were socially frowned upon, and one had to be personally responsible for controlling their love interests. Though this example is somewhat antiquated, it gives us reason to suppose that love addiction is viewed as a tendency against cultural norms rather than a mental illness. For the fifth set of questions, one can note the extent of the harms of love addiction on their own self, example put forth by Chen. In her book, Unrequited, Women in Romantic Obsession, the journalist Lisa Phillips recounts how, after being rejected by a lover, she checked herself into a medical center because she didn't know what else to do. The psychiatry resident gave her a prescription for painkillers, telling her that she was far from the only one to check herself in because of love trouble. Many people have friends who can't seem to move on, and the internet is full of pleas from those who don't understand why unrequited love still hurts. Based on the first question, it seems pretty clear that one can have insight into the effects of love on their personal health. But applying the second question to love addiction may yield more than one result. On the one hand, Phillips did take an active role to try and find solutions to her problem, and it wasn't particularly difficult to do so. But it was difficult for her to come to grips with the nature of her overbearing infatuation, compromising their potential active role, so pinning her morally responsible for having these feelings discounts her sincere confusion over why the feelings impacted her sense of self. With that being said, her independent method of seeking help for her condition suggests that her active state does in fact remain. Therefore, labeling this addiction as a pure mental illness would be somewhat irresponsible given the autonomous nature of a person's response to the effect. In conclusion, three of the five criteria discussed indicate the potential of overbearing love addiction being a disorder, but there is reason to believe that society can uphold values about love moderation and additional reason to suppose that one could seek treatment and have insight into the condition's effect. Uh, there doesn't seem to be enough evidence pinning love addiction as a mental illness. Rather, it seems that the condition is largely socially oriented and how one internalizes these ideals may determine the impact of the condition in their own life. Um, there's an ability to create systems to limit the influence of love, and this gives reason not to cly this addiction as a mental illness, though its issues should be noted and treated.